kindly allow me to welcome you all to Fela Debates 10. Collaboration 2018, captioned, overtaken, overtaken. Today is a very auspicious day because it marks Fela's 80th posthumous birthday. It is also some 19 years since we've been holding celebration from 1999, two years after the legend departed. And incidentally, this also marks 21 years of Fela's exit from this life. And interestingly enough, we even predate the Third Republic, uh, which is 18 years old. Celebration is celebrated this year in 16 countries and we have 21 licen licensed partners across the world. This unprecedented festival in honor of this great lead to Pendle's great man, the our musical genius, political activist and cultural icon. Today's topic is African leadership in the Bidei which is a very highly relevant topic, as we are quite practically on the eve of the 2019 general election. And in support of uh, this uh, upcoming elections, we have assembled for you four speakers who are in their own rights and acclaimed presidential aspirants for next year's general election. We have carefully selected our speakers to reflect the emerging growing trend of breaking new ground, a new beginning, a trend to reveal a new breed of politicians, dynamic, youthful, charismatic, and representing a new age, changing the narrative of gerontocracy and retraining of the same old leadership we have had in the past, who have offered little or nothing new to the police. So, in the year that we at the African Shrine welcome another groundbreaking beautiful leader of a superpower in the person of Emmanuel Macron, the President of France, we present for you today perhaps our own answer to this new emerging trend of dynamic young leaders with a lineup of speakers today. You can see they are here seated on the high table. Um, we had initially wanted to satisfy the issue of gender equality with having two female speakers and two male speakers. But unfortunately, we had a withdrawal in the person of uh, Dr. Mrs. Obi Isikwisi, but she is ably represented by Mr. Tuchi Lam. We also have We also have next to him Mr. Fela Duro to him, who I'm sure is no stranger, another professional aspirant, hugely popular, young and dynamic. And of course our firebrand, the founder and creator of Sahara Reporter. He is a renowned journalist 
and the celebrated polemicist, the recent winner of the best political analyst of the year at the 12th Nigeria Media Night Out Award. This former editor of the news and PM News, now editorial head of TV Continental News, is the arrowhead of journalist Hangout. Regarded <laughs> journalist Hangout is regarded as arguably the best political program on television today. He is highly regarded as one of Nigeria's most respected public affairs analysts with a deep and always illuminating viewpoint which displays of usual insight and vast knowledge of the often confusing and bewildering nuances in our contemporary political space. He has been described as a long, lifelong activist for good governance. So without much further ado, can I call him up to give us his opening address and introduce and set the ball rolling for today. Thank you very much. Eminently, eminently in the market commerce, represented 
year on year, we are represented in the most shameful manner. You look at a country like the Nigeria Republic in 2015, out of 188 countries, Nigeria Republic placed 187 in the UN Human Development Index. It shows to you that apart from the fact that geography has not been particularly very good to the Nigerian Republic, because 80% of its land mass is actually covered by the Sahara. But successive leaders have not done much to change the narrative, to make that country better. Nigeria Republic is today a failed state. And one reason Nigeria has not been able to defeat Boko Haram is because of Nigeria Republic. Because Boko Haram has active cells inside the Nigeria Republic. So when Nigerian troops are chasing them, they go into the Nigeria Republic and they hide. Once they get inside the Nigeria Republic, there is nothing you can do to them. And I can explain this by just one illustration. The local governments where Boko Haram still remains active in Nigeria are those local governments that border the Nigeria Republic. Abadan, Mati, and Moba in, in uh, Borno states. Of course, they will tell you that Boko Haram does not occupy any Nigerian territory. As I always say on the program, it is a lie from the pit of hell. We have a big problem on our hands. How do we defeat those monsters? We can only defeat those monsters if the countries around us, where they continue to find refuge, cooperate fully. So I hope that in the fullness of time, leadership will improve across the continent. Improve, especially in the general public so that my own country can benefit from improvements in the quality of leadership in that, in that country. Everyone talks about Rwanda now. Many years back, Rwanda was written off as a country. My admonition to everyone here is that we should not write Africa off. Let's continue to have hope that that time will come when Africa will have the right kind of leaders, leaders that can make a difference, leaders that can make good things happen. For now, we don't have them, whether in Nigeria or anywhere. We simply don't have those leaders, except we want to make a career out of deceiving ourselves. We don't have those good leaders, but we won't give up. And I'm sure that our panelists today will be doing justice to this unusual topic about an unusual continent. Thank you for coming. Let me invite our first speaker. The inimitable, eloquent, brilliant, and one of the brightest of his generation, Mr. Felagro today. Take it back, then there will be more noise here. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I really want to say today is a very special day, and special on many counts for me and for even the continent of Africa. Um, first, let me start by saying a big thank you to 
the organizers of Fellowbration, and for keeping up this great work and for getting it better and brighter and bigger every year. So if you don't mind, I'll ask you to please put your hands together for me. And whilst we celebrate the 80th birthday posthumously of this great icon, this piece of amazingness that we all have come to know and love. Some of us um, may have learned about him just by reading, but some of us had the good fortune of really knowing him, meeting him personally, and in my own case, at the age of 12, sharing a stage with him at the Odugua Hall of the Obafemi Awolo University in 1983. Great event. At that time, I was a young boy, 12 years old, leading a, a musical youth band called Need Waves. And in one of the shows where we were performing, the great fella was also performing. And because my father was schoolmates and classmates with fella in Abeokuta Grammar School, and um, at their first time when they, they, they set up a band together, and my father was the guitarist and they would skip from the stories, they would skip uh, the, the, the fence and go into town in the evenings. So when my manager at that time, Topme Babaya Netopsi, heard the story of how the fact that my, grand, my father and Fela were very close friends, he decided to take me to, to Fela and of course by the, at the mention of my father's name, you know, the, the great icon, the great legend stood up, hugged me, and you know, just chatted briefly with me, but it felt like I was there forever. So today is a special day for me to be here at Celebration. It's my first time of being here. But today is also a very special day for Africa. Because 73 years ago, on this very same day, October 15, in a little hotel in Manchester, 90 young men and women gathered together in that hotel and they were there for about six days between the 15th of October and the 21st of October. And nothing really much was written about that particular meeting, but it was a meeting that was going to change the world, at least for Africa, the way that they knew it. At that meeting, there were people like Kwame Nkrumah. There were people like Kamuzu Banda, Hastings Banda, before he changed his name to Kamuzu Banda. There were people like Jomo Kenyatta, who were in that room. And of course, there were people like Obafemi Awolo, who were also at what was called the Fifth Pan-African Congress. And it was the fifth Pan-African Congress that history bears as the core trigger where 90 young people decided that it was time for them to take back their future from the hands of colonialists who had made them second-class citizens in their own countries. And even though the, the meeting was happening in Manchester, United Kingdom, because the colonialists took them for granted, I guess in the words of show, right? they call them inconsequential. And so, at one point or the other, they didn't even do anything about it until it was literally too late. Fifteen years later, about 24 of the African countries had already positioned, and many of them had already entered into independence, based on one meeting that took place 73 years ago. So, if you look at it, in 1945, when that meeting took place, Obafemi Awolo, who was born in 1909, was 36 years old. Kwame Nkrumah, who was also born in 1909, was also 36 years old. These were the guys who were taking a decision for their continent. These were the guys who were challenging the status quo. They didn't have money, they didn't have pedigree, 
They didn't have, they barely had an education. I mean, above him, I literally have just graduated, I believe, in 1944 from law. So this was fresh graduates. If there was MIC in the United Kingdom, he would have been an MIC. He would have been a youth copper at the age of 36. But we must remember they were young and they were visionary. And they had no prior experience in governance. But they had a vision. They had an idea that their country was better than it was the way that they had been born into it. That their people deserved better than being second class citizens in their own nation. And they had come to a, a common understanding that they were a generation that was born for liberation. They had come to a common understanding that they were a generation that had the divine mandate to liberate their own people and to give freedom to their children. And they worked hard at it. They worked across board. They were united across tribe, they were united across religion, they were united across social barriers. They came together within their countries and even then, even when one of them or the other would get independence, they would not stop until all of them got independence. Because they understood the power of unity in overcoming every great challenge. And so, for Nigeria, the success story was that on Saturday, the 1st of October, 1960, Sir Tafar Abu Bakr Tafar Balewa, stood on the podium and read his independent speech as the first Prime Minister of the Federation of Nigeria. Now, you must remember that Abu Bakr Tafar Balewa himself was born in 1912. So as and when he was reading the speech as the leader of Nigeria, he was 48 years old. That is how old I will be next year when I'm reading my presidential inauguration speech. So a 48 year old man was okay to lead Nigeria. And for those of you who would please Google it if you haven't already seen it, I think one of the most important things that we can ever watch is a USIS video of a visit of Sir Abubakar Tafal Balewa to the United States on July 25, 1961, barely nine months after he read his Independence Day speech. And if, when you watch that video, there are many emotions that will well up in you because essentially you would see how America and Americans came out to honor a man and his team who couldn't even afford to fly in on their own country's presidential jets. And whilst Abu Bakr Tafabalewa and his entourage flew in on the presidential jet of the United States of America, they were met at the, at, the, at the airport by the Vice President, Lyndon Johnson. They were met by the Secretary of State and a delegation of great, great statesmen from the United States. These were the people who were meeting young men under the age of 50. And why did they treat us with so much pomp and pageantry? Because they were looking at this young man and they could see hope. Not only hope for a nation, but hope for a continent. They didn't see a rich country. Our first oil well, as many of you know, was drilled in 1959. This was barely a year and a half after the first oil well was drilled. They didn't see an oil rich country. They just saw a nation reflecting a continent where young people had decided to take their future in their own hands and were able to organize themselves in unity across everything that the colonialists had used to divide them and rule them. And they were able to come together and overcome 
and achieve their goal. And that was what the world was celebrating. And the world had great hopes for Nigeria. The world had great hopes for Africa. And many of you know, over time, those hopes have been dashed. Those hopes are almost being buried, not just by the world, but even by the people of Africa ourselves. So sometime in the course, less than four years or so after, a group of military boys decided to overtake. And the interesting thing is that since they overtook, they come block the road so that nobody will come fit to overtake them. But a new generation has come to overtake the overtakers. Some of those who are still alive today include General Gowan from that particular generation who took over the reins of power at the age of 31. And under his own watch, on the 24th of March, 1971, the year that I was born, one Nigerian pound exchanged for three US dollars. So if you took 100 Nigerian pounds to the Bureau de Change, you would get 300 United States dollars for 100 Nigerian pounds under the leadership of a young man. And then, even amongst themselves, they were still overtaking. And it turned out that by 1976, a young general by the name of Olusha Gwabasonjo, under circumstances obviously not, not very pleasant at that time, took over the reins of power and he took over two weeks before his 39th birthday. So Basunjo was 38 years old when he became head of state. Two weeks later, he became 39. And at the year that Obasanjo took over, 1976, on the same day as I just quoted to you, March 24, one Nigerian Naira was exchanging for $1.33. Meaning that if you took one Naira to the Bureau de Change, you would get 133 US dollars. And then over time, Obasanjo handed over. And then the military took over again. And at one point in time, our current president, then General Muhammad Buhari, took over on the 31st of December 1983, two weeks after his own 41st birthday. So by the time General Buhari took over the reins of power in Nigeria, I today am 47 years old. That is, I'm six years older than Buhari when he took over as, as head of state. As you know the story, over time, the age of the leaders grew older and older and older. And by 2006, when they were playing the musical chairs, they brought up on job back again. Of course, that came in 1990, 1999, and Obasanjo was there till 2007. In 2006, on the same day, March 24, this is 30 years after Obasanjo's first experience as head of state. Remember what I said to you. In 1976, March 24, whilst Obasanjo was head of state, one naira was $1.33. By 2006, now Obasanjo being president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, on the same day, one dollar is now exchanging for 133 naira. Meaning that as Obasanjo grew older, okay, not maybe him, but as the leadership of Nigeria grew older, our currency grew weaker. So perhaps it will come to a point in time when we will be able to reverse the trend concerning the strength of our currency 
as we fix our economy, when younger people will once again take the ranks and the, 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 the statemanship of this country and we would lead Nigeria to our glory times again. But because these ones that have become older have refused to step aside, they will need to be overtaken. But they will need to be overtaken by a generation because they didn't come in as one, they came in as a generation. So it will not be one Eunice or one fella or one Shogore that will be able to get this thing done. It's going to be a collaboration of Eunice and Fela and Shore to bring to pass the kind of thing that we need to do. So I serve notice to the next, to the older generation. This generation have refused to learn and teach her. Please don't come and teach us nonsense. Because we cannot learn democracy from those who do not know democracy. So I bring my thoughts towards the close. All across Africa, God has blessed a continent beyond general, just beyond description. There are many studies that have shown that the resources that are required by the world to survive in the 21st century, 60% or so of those resources actually lie in the continent of Africa, especially blessed nation, with mineral resources, natural resources, and human resources. But we have not been able to leave out the fullness of our potential for a very simple reason. We have not really experienced leadership. We have experienced rulership, but not leadership. Because what rulers do is rulers amass subjects, but leaders inspire followers. to truly democratic civilians who will lead Nigeria back to the path of greatness.
I believe that it will take a generational collaboration. It will not just be a collaboration amongst candidates and aspirants, it will be a collaboration amongst the people. It will be a generation of people who refuse to be divided by party, who refuse to be divided and who refuse to fight themselves. It will be a generation of people who will clap for everyone that represents their generation, regardless of whether they are in their party or not. Some people have been able, have been tackling me and saying, why is it that you are always celebrating other people? Well, Shorere has celebrated me. Why should I not celebrate Shorere? Eunice Atejude has celebrated me. Why should I not celebrate her? We need to help this older generation know that the time of old, bitter competition amongst rivals is over. It is now time for better collaboration. Amongst the generation. The greatness of Nigeria is at hand. And it will emerge. And I want to congratulate all of you who are here today. And I pray that you would leave to see Nigeria, the, the greatness of Nigeria will come back again so that everything that fell off what against will become not just a song, but an experience. And I said I was going to do something. So you permit me, I've wanted to do it for a long time. And it is to do something that I did many years ago. And to sing a little part of Fela's song. So if you know it, you will sing it with me, and then I will hand over the microphone. All the wahala, all the problems, all the things where we think say good do for this is what the start. When the teacher, school boy and school girl jam together, who be teacher? I go let you know. Who be teacher? I go let you know. When we did for school, when we did university, when we start to walk, who become the teacher? Including shameful lady, young people. 
we think that salvation lies in antiquated humans walking the faces, I mean walking the face of the earth. You know why I call them antiquated? Because their ideas have no place in today's world. The ideas are old and have no place in today's world. And that's the message that Fela drew to him eloquently brought to us today. But I want to remind you that we should not just listen and clap. We should invite the message. And I've always said that young people have a weapon that they refused to use. You have the weapon. There are more younger people in Nigeria than old people. There are more young people in Nigeria than old people. If we would take politics seriously, if we would not just busy ourselves, just listening to music, watching telenovelas, if we would take seriously the matter of our state, if we take seriously getting our PVCs, and taking a, an active part in determining those who will rule us. Honestly, the young leaders will imagine our country. Maybe you think that it can happen, but it will happen. Women, for example, if you know that in Kano, a woman won direct primaries to the House of Reps, women have been repressed over the years and they're not, not allowed to offer themselves to be voted for. But the day women unite, because they are easier to mobilize on election day than men, the day women unite that they want to rule the country, honestly, they have the voting strength. All of these people that we routinely elect who go there simply to turn Nigeria to a buffet. I'm telling you that that time will come when they will be replaced by the right people. I know some of us are not religious, so I can't hear a man. It's not loud. So, one takeaway from this paper presented by Feladro Toye is the need for generational collaboration. As a people, we need to collaborate. As a generation, we need to collaborate. I'll be more excited if a young man like Fela leads my country. I'll be very proud. Wherever he speaks, I will say, yes, this is my leader, a leader that I'll be proud of. You see now, when, when Uru Kayata, when he begins to speak, you see the pride with which Kenyans listen. That's the way it should be. And Nigeria is not in short of the bright people who can truly make us proud, provide the right leadership, lead us competently. I'm confident that we'll get there one day. But we must work hard. So I want to bring on the representative of OBZ President, Mr. Tuji Lambo. Destiny has a hand in 
ensuring that I'm here. This is one of those happenstance where you could not have planned it. Here I am, celebrating Pella, and anybody who understands and knows my own history with Pella. Okay, so thank you. Is this better now? All right, in that case, everybody say yeah, yeah. Everybody say yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And as a nod to my brother there, very grudgingly, <laughs> I come a very long way with Fela, and I don't want to start talking about my own history with Fela. Everybody has their own notion of uh, narratives about it. But suffice to say that uh, Fela rented my father's nightclub, uh, Afro Sport. And this is 30, 40 years ago. So I grew up uh, listening to Fela and, uh, you know, really being indoctrinated by Fela. So as I was saying, my own presentation here is basically my own summation of the theme for today, which is uh, African leadership in the millennium. And uh, I know it's not a poor substitute because you're all waiting for Obi. And of course, how do you talk Fela's rousing presentation? But I think there's something valid that I might want to contribute to this conversation here. Um, I'm particularly pleased that he picked up on the sub-theme of overtake, trying to overtake. And the question now becomes, within the context of Africa, leadership, millennium, how can we overtake this generation? That's one question I'm going to leave hanging out there. The other thing that uh, is also clear is that even as we speak about Africa, there's a slight nod and deference to Nigeria, basically, because as the... Uh, Organizer has mentioned this is an election year. Um, oftentimes, in the public discourse space, we wonder if Africa is indeed a country or a continent. Oftentimes, you know, when we're reading the critique of the West, we all homogenize into one unit called Africa as if there are no points of differentiation. And so sometimes we fight that Africa is not a country as uh, the West would like us to believe, that Africa is indeed a continent with varied interests, varied history, but a collective sense of destiny. So, by terms, Africa can both be a country and a continent. And it's within these two framings that I go to direct my presentation. Obviously talking about Africa as a continent, but also, more importantly, talking about Africa represented by Nigeria as a country. So the question of leadership is basically at the heart of this now. Um, as we enter the 21st century. There are some statistics I gleaned, you know, this morning as a matter of fact, that I thought would uh, provide some kind of a statistical background as to what it is we are challenged with. Because you can't solve problems if you cannot measure them. In uh, March this year, in Rwanda, there was the emergence of what is called the uh, Africa Single Market. That finally, after Kwame Nkrumah in 1957 said Africa must unite, after the last song about African unity, there is actually the basis for a formalized single market for the continent. And that is a very big plus. It's taken us from 1960 to 2018, 58 years, to get to a point where we realize that our strengths actually lie together. We're stronger together as Africans. The other thing that comes out of that is the statistics that uh, shows that there's a growing African middle class. By some estimates, by 2030, there'll be half a billion Africans with about $2 trillion worth of spending power. And 2030 is just, what, another 10, 10 years barely? So there's something to be said about in spite of the negative uh, um, outliers of governance, I mean, and the dinosaurs my friend was referring to, places like uh, Cameroon, uh, Equatorial Guinea, uh, Uganda, and I'm going to go back to Uganda for one particular point I want to make. Africa is actually moving quantitatively in terms of the economics of it, but it's an uneven development. In terms of the de demographics, it is expected that by 2030, there will be 320 million Africans, young Africans within the age group of, um, I think, 15 to 24. So Africa is resourced on multiple levels. Somebody mentioned that Africa has perhaps 60% of the global resources that will be needed to power the entire planet in this new millennium. Africa also has 
perhaps also in the same parity, 60% of the youthful population, the human capital that is essential, that is really at the core of our own value proposition on this global world space. So Africa is a very young continent in spite of the predations of these dinosaurs. And it's important for us to realize that we do have a future both in material resources, but more importantly, in the human resources. The question now becomes, how do we harness both? Those are the challenges of leadership in the new millennium. And it might not be very clear as we ponder our own state of affairs, with Africa, quote unquote, being a country, slash Nigeria, where we're going in that. It's, in, it's, in, it's, in, it's instrumental that at this point, in a country where the median age, I think, is 17, the two top uh, political uh, parties are fielding candidates in their 70s. What we have to understand is take step back and look at it again. What we're witnessing is the end of a cycle. What we're witnessing is the end of a cycle. My own phrasing is the class of 66, the guys who took over, but basically created what I call the military political complex, in which they created a system in which they've captured the state from 1966 there on, with the active conspiracy of politicians, ethnicists, and generally a ruling class that is predatory, venal, corrupt, all the wonderful names you can call them. But they sit on top of Nigeria's uh, uh, future. They're a very small silver sliver of people, perhaps no more than two million people, who have access to 80% of the resources. So these are kind of the bare bones facts that we're contending with. I also want to talk about human resources as a counter to this narrative of oil. It is not about oil anymore. The value of oil per percentage of our GDP has diminished over the last, I think last quarter is about 8.2%. So oil itself is not really where our wealth is. It's in the formal sector, in the growing informal sector, in farming, agriculture, in small uh, services the mom and pop shop, the woman who sells a car, those are the people that constitute the backbone of the, the engine of growth in Nigeria. The other major chunk is the Nigerian diaspora, all the repartees, all the Nigerians overseas who send in at least, uh, I think by last account, $25 billion a year, coming from Nigerians living in the diaspora. So we have to step back and look at it and challenge the dominant narrative that Oil is everything. No, oil is what services the graft machine, which is the Nigerian state. And that oil is what services the two million people that are fighting for political power, who form the ruling elite. What uh, our political uh, presidential candidates are fighting for now is how do we wrest control of the state? Because it has been captured thoroughly. What are the uh, sub-national levels in the state governments? and at the very national level of the federal government. And those are the large existential challenges that we have to consider as we now we consider the issue of uh, leadership. The thing about uh, the future of Africa's leadership is that it is anchored on two or three things. One I would like to share with you is, again, going back to the demographics. Nigeria's demographics is just atrocious. I think there was a report that now says it's widely circulated, I think about 87 million people living in destitution. How can a country be so rich and yet so poor? Nigeria is a rich country full of poor people. That paradox is what we have to challenge. And those are the challenges before my presidential uh, aspirants here now. Those are the real issues. The real issues is not whether uh, a team can visit uh, the US or whether uh, Buhari has more 50 cows or not. And, and this is where this, this this very wily group of people have misdirected us. It's almost like one of those Professor Pella tricks. The more you look, the less you see. Glory changer, barbari changer. They've shifted attention from what is the core challenge of this country. How do we take care of these young people? How can we have a country where 10.4 million children are out of school? It's unconscionable. I mean, I can't say this thing without my eyes welling up. I cannot honestly, because it is an emotion. It's an emotional issue for me. Because you see your country as if you're watching a movie of a train in 
in a slow, a train wreck in slow motion. That's what it is like. We're seeing it going over the cliff and we're all shouting, no, don't do that. But somehow, nothing happens. Why? Because the people who are being wrecked, young people, seem curiously different. I had a sidebar conversation with the fellow and he pointed out something that was very useful for me. I said, what, when are we as, when are young Nigerians come to, going to come to terms with the fact that on the basis of their own enlightened self-interest, they have to capture back the state through political participation, through nomination and the support of candidates like this. He says, well, for you to have enlightened self-interest, you first have to be enlightened. So the question now is, where do we start? It's a chicken and egg situation. We are rapidly going over the cliff with a whole horde of young people who are quote unquote not enlightened. And it was deliberate. I mean, I have, been, I have a historical sense of Nigeria. I've been writing about Nigeria for 40 years. So I understand it from a purely experiential historical perspective. Writing around the military as a young person, getting into trouble, getting arrested, almost being killed. We have the credentialing there, but we never anticipated it was getting to a point where we have literally 87 million people poor, 120 million Nigerians under the age of 35. So you have this vast army of young people. And where and how do we switch? What will turn that switch? I think that the key challenge for us here is really not to worry about the technical things. That's what they're doing about us. I mean, so I'm going to build you 10,000 10, kilometers of roads. I'm going to do this. That's not Nigeria's problem. Nigeria's problem is not technical. Nigeria's problem is adaptive. Nigeria's problem is not technical. It's not technology per se. It is psychology. So the question now is, how can we reset the mindset of Nigerians, especially young Nigerians, to the point where they can overtake this present narrative and create their own narrative? In the many talks, I, I usually don't uh, talk to young people. I always try to introduce time as a concept to them. But okay, we're looking at it within a space-time continuum. The past we know already. The present is fleeting. The moment you say present, it becomes the past. But the future is what the philosophers call a tabula rasa. It's a blank slate. So the future of Nigeria is yet to be written. It is not a fair and complete that either Buhari, Atiku, or whoever those people from the class of 66 represent are going to be the president of Nigeria next year. Because it's the future, and the future is yet to be written. The question is how can we harness the power of young people to make enlightened choices to change this prevalent narrative. That's one challenge. The second challenge is how do we expunge the culture of militarization in our, in our mindset? We who grew up under the military and wrote under the military understand that. But to see it manifest in a generation that had no direct contact with the military is frightening to us. How do you change and switch that mindset? One way you can do that is as young people often tell me, is technology. I think technology might be one of the ways in which you can overtake, overtake. And, you know, by all estimates, I did some work last year, and uh, the statistics were that, uh, by NCC, that 90 million plus Nigerians use the internet one way or the other. Mobile transfers, you know, where young people are using it. And that Facebook, has about 26 million and growing Nigerians. Well, 26 million people on Facebook as a community is larger than the next three countries beside Nigeria, Togo, Benin. So my own thing is, how can we use that part of technology? Because technology is going to be an intrinsic part of Africa's growth over the next millennium. Because you're talking about a young population who are all wired, Presently, across Africa, I think internet penetration is about 20%. It's probably going to grow with a low cost of data. So the question now becomes, if you have 26 million people on Facebook, that is a virtual country. So I want us to just expand the prospects, you know, and uh, move beyond, as Fela would say, this goddamn contraption, and get into the underground spiritual game. But the underground spiritual game here now 
is technology. How can we look at Africa differently? How can we harness the resources of young Africans? And I'm saying that within the context of Africa being a continent and Africa being a country as in Nigeria. How can we create the virtual republic of Nigeria where all the ideas that we have can be debated, all the prospects, our dreams, our aspirations can be contested, and how can we use these tools to shape an alternative narrative for where we're going? That, those are the challenges, I think. And I'm going to wind up by I, I'm, I'm going to wind up by, by suggesting that we go back to the master of all of this. Uh, one of my favorite uh, fellow stories, and a couple of them, was many years ago in the US, we went, a group of us went to visit uh, Professor Chinua Achebe when he was at Bard College. It was just shortly after his accident. So we drove up um, the Hudson River, went to Bard College, and were ushered into Prof's house, which had been uh, modified to allow his wheelchair. And there he was sitting in his living room, uh, his wheelchair, with his black, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, tank top, um, and then his black beret waiting for us. In the back, Brown was Fela's music just blasting away constantly. So I could not reconcile Professor Chino Achebe with Fela. It was just one of those crazy mind altering experiences. So I asked Prof, uh, uh, Prof why, why are you listening to Fela? The guy, you know, is a very profound man. He picks his words. He said, hmm, why am I listening to Fela? He said, Fela the sage of our times. Fela is, I've never, this is over 20 years ago. And this is what young people are recover, uh, just rediscovering. Before I leave, I'm going to op, you know, offer some kind of a discography. If you really want to understand Nigeria's problem and Africa's problem, I suggest you do the full, a couple of things. Forget Afro beats. Go back to the authentic Afro beats as represented by this gentleman. I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at overtake the logo. Is fella, his music can never, ever, can ever die. Let me offer a disco discography for you guys, you young people who think that uh, Afro beats is a thing. Go back to the on underground spiritual sound of fella. And I'm offering a couple of tunes for you. Uh, one thing you have to watch is uh, the, do the documentary, Music is a Weapon. You have to watch that documentary to really understand that music is a weapon. I mentioned Uganda a while ago. If you ever have any doubts that music is a weapon, check out Bobby Wine in Uganda. If you ever, ever had any doubts about the influence of Fela's prophecies as the sage of our time, talking about music being the weapon, go to Uganda and see what another musician is doing in Uganda, a young person trying to change things. You guys might want to borrow a leaf from him too, Bobby Wine. Um, I think there were four ones that just came out of my mind, tunes. You have to listen to why, why black men they suffer. I hope you're taking notes. This is not assurance, so. <laughs> Suffering and smiling. What I no get enemy. And Africa center of the world. Thank you very much. President of Uganda. In 
having just finished uh, youth service, I was on internship at the Democrats in Sweepers, in Kaduna. By the way, Democrats is history. <laughs> and African leaders came to Abuja for a meeting. The president of Uganda was then interviewed. They wanted them to talk about the seat tightism, the seat tight syndrome, for which African leaders are ill reputed. And Museveni said, any leader who spends more than 10 years in office must have overstayed his welcome. He's been in office for 32 years. <laughs> He's been in office for 32 years. So this is one of the problems we have with African leaders. They don't know when to quit. But as, um, as all the speakers have said here, the young people need to come together. Never believe that it is impossible. I was with the with the president's wife recently, and she was telling me the progress being made, trying to get women to get more involved in the electoral process. And during this last primary elections in Adama State, out of three senatorial seats, women won two. Two out of the three. So it is possible. Those things that you think, oh, over the years, nobody could do it. It is possible to do those things now. But we have to be resolute. We have to be determined. If young people want to seize power, we must take the matter of seizing power seriously. I agree with that. The 1966 generation is a passing phase. And we have to do our best to lead them out through the door so that a new generation of committed leadership can take over the African political landscape. This is my wish. I'm sure it's the wish of the majority of us here. So I want to bring on now uh, a very resourceful woman a lawyer who has practiced in Europe and our country, a true pride of the Nigerian woman. So, put your hands together as I invite Eunice. Dos Santos, 
uh, the former president Angola who just left last year and Mugabe who also left last year, we still have the number one, like we are still seven of the top ten longest seven presidents in Africa. And guess what? These countries where these guys are serving are the least productive, least successful, least peaceful. They have, they're at the bottom of the pile in every sense you can think of. That tells us that staying long in office is more a problem for the country than what we have in Nigeria, which is like, when we tire for you, we send you packing. So, Cameroon, for example, has Paul Bia, who is doing like 43, 43 years or so. He's done uh, six years as prime minister before he became uh, president. They are suffering. Equatorial Guinea has uh, Theodoro Mbasogo. It's very hard for me to pronounce their names. Most of these people are in their 70s and 80s, and he's been sitting there for 38 years. Equatorial Guinea has oil, but they are suffering. Republic of Congo, Dennis Ngwesu, he's been sitting there now for 38 years too. They are suffering. Uganda, my friend's place, where he's praising them, they are actually suffering. And the man, when he came indeed to Nigeria, I was very young, but I remember my dad talking about it, that any African leader who stays more than 10 years is wicked. Now he's 22 years and he's not even ready to go yet. Yet, Ugandans are suffering. Sudan, Eritrea, Chad, everywhere you look where these guys are sitting down as if it's their own birthright to hold power and do with it whatever they want, their people are suffering. But we don't have that problem in Nigeria. So again, we have a lot to be grateful for. Let me quickly touch on Rwanda. Rwanda has a Kagame, who is there now 18 years, and he came from the military room. Most times these men come as the saviors. They go against the establishment, they get rid of them. But after they get rid of them, they sit there and they forget that they got the people to come together, work with them for that vision of getting away, uh, getting rid of these old guys, these wicked guys, who, these guys who are not letting them live the life they deserve to, to live. They help them, they get rid of these people, they install these new leaders, these saviors, and then they start suffering. Rwanda, 18 years of Paul Kagame's rule, it's still going well. He started as the military, fight them all, Tutsi, Hutu, uh, they are killing those things, and he was quite mean in a lot of ways, but he's been president of Rwanda for a while now, and I would say he's doing quite well, but this is still 18 years and he already changed the laws, the constitutional laws to allow him another 15 to 17 more years. So he's highly likely to spend 32, 38, 40 years in power. And what I envisage is that they will go from this beautiful Rwanda that is working so well to another country where they are suffering. Let's bring it home to Nigeria, because that's where we all end up. We are very lucky. We are very lucky because for whatever reason, all our differences, all our wickedness, we manage to work it out so that nobody, nobody at all, can make us suffer for too long. We get rid of them somehow. And that is good. And that's where we need to build from. When Obasanjo first became uh, head of state. He was 38, 39, I actually thought, but from what Feladroche said, he was actually just 38, going to be 39, as head of state, uniform, military. He came back, when he came back, he was 62, as the civilian president. We didn't suffer too much. We suffered, but it wasn't too much. It wasn't the worst of all the leaders we had had when he came back as a civilian. Then he left Ayarada to over. Ayarada was 56. Ayarada would have done well, I think, but he was too sick to do anything, so he died too soon. And then good luck Jonathan took over, he was 53. 
So we've gone 62, we've gone 56, we've come down to 53, and that 53 is still younger than some of us who are claiming youth, trying to remove them. Jonathan didn't do too well, but he was definitely nowhere near as bad as what we have today. What we have today, in my opinion, is the worst we will ever have. It's the worst we have ever had, and it is the worst we will ever have. We will not take it. Nigerians do not take it. When you come in and you do not perform for some reason, the people who designed our laws designed them so well that you cannot entrench yourself. Abacha couldn't do it. Buhari cannot do it. We will remove him. But what I want us to understand is that it's not about just removing Buhari and replacing with young or new faces. It is very, very important that we think about the quality of these new faces, of these new, younger generation leadership we are wanting to replace Buhari with. It is so much more important to pick right than to pick young or new. That's where I come in. I'm running for office, but I'm not saying pick Eunice because she's a young woman or new. I'm saying go beyond what you're hearing me say. Don't just listen to all the things that I copy from all the other people and paste together and come and gist to you. Don't just look at all the activism and all the boldness that you see because all these men and women who came in at the ages of 35 to 45, none of them came in at 80, apart from the Nigerian ones. All these people whose citizens are dying and suffering came in at the ages of 35 to 40 and they sat there. And if we make the mistake of picking people who do not care actually about the processes, about democracy, about the personalities, about the promises that they make to us while they stand on the podium. If we pick people who just say things because they have heard others say them, we will put people back there who will be worse than our current president. It's not about age at all. I am the founder and the national chairman of the National Interest Party, and most of us are under 40 at NIP. However, we know that amongst those of us, even in that age, we have some evil people. And it's the same in every institution. Amongst all of us running for office of president under the age of 50 or 60 or 40 or 30 even, we have some evil people. You need to see beyond what we are telling you. You need to look at the processes we use in emerging leaders, in our private businesses, how we relate with you in the public, how we treat our staff, how we take seriously the promises we make to you every day. What kind of lies have you caught us in? What kind of lives do we lead away from the cameras? If you can get behind the cameras, do so. Do so because that is the only way you see the true pictures. And you have to see the true pictures to pick the true leaders, the true lovers of Nigeria, the ones that will fight for you no matter what. It has nothing to do with age. It has everything to do with character integrity, sincerity, honesty. I have no problem having a 120-year-old man or woman leading me, provided the person is sincere, honest, open, can carry us along and let us understand everything they're doing for us or some of the things they may have to do against us just to keep everything together. As long as we are part of the process, as long as we are contributing our quota from every part of this country, 
and we have the right people who are thinking about us. Each time they make decisions for this country, they make it thinking about every unit. We will be fine. It has absolutely nothing to do with age. It has absolutely nothing to do with tribe, religion, and all the other differences they try to tell us is the reason we are not functioning together. We can function together, and we will function together, provided those of us who have the opportunity to make the choices, make the right choices. We can do better as Africans, we can do better as Nigerians, but better is not necessarily younger. Thank you. We elect young leaders. 
I'm not disagreeing with Eunice, but we'll find them. We'll find them. They are available. I agree. literally the same. We want a better Nigeria. We work together in the news magazine before it set up You've been told that my speech will be the best here today. You'll be disappointed. I am uh, very sick, and uh, I mean it. I'm sick and tired of this country. Yes. Very sick. And um, but I'll start with a small story. And this happened between me and Fella. Wrote to you last week. We went to see Professor Walesha Ika. And he called us into a small room in the Kedja. And he told us how he met Atiku. You know, I like to name names, right? Uh, he said to Atiku, so Atiku is sitting across from him. And he asked Atiku, what is it that you have fresh to offer Nigeria? He said that Atiku looked at him and said, eh, I have some things. I'm a good person. I do some nice things. The other time, I opened my university when there were refugees running away. I said, Prof, said, that's very good. I'm asking you, what is it you will do differently if you're president of Nigeria that you couldn't do when you were vice president for eight years? I think we couldn't answer. And he then said to him, if you have anything to offer Nigeria since you've been born, and the thing cannot be transferred to the younger generation of Nigerians, that means that idea is useless. He said, after he left him, Atiku and his entourage, including Ben Gadaniel, couldn't take pictures with him. So that event was not known to the public until today that I'm talking to you. Because they had to leave 
Shoyika with their tail in between their legs. Of course, the moment they saw that Shoyika could not be fooled, they went to that man in Ota. Yes. Who is always speaking from both sides of his mouth. The dishonest, unpatriotic, inhuman about And asked him, well, Baba, with all the traditional rulers doing their normal roles, religious leaders, both Muslim and Christians, and said, you have to forgive Atiku because Atiku is coming back to be president of Nigeria. The usual unpatriotic, inhuman, and wicked of John invited Atiku to his house and told us that he has not forgiven Atiku. The same Atiku, he claimed that God will not pardon him if he ever recommended to be president of Nigeria. He recommended again to go and destroy Nigeria. And I said somewhere on here last week, you know, I'm not going to speak too much about Africa's history. I teach post-colonial Africa history in the University of New York for eight years. There's nothing there. He said to him, I said at that program that if it is true that there is God and God doesn't punish your pastor just this time around, so many of us will stop going to church. That's the truth. Because the truth is that wherever God is, he doesn't preside over the affairs of Nigerians anymore. They have been designed their own God. Hello? Their God don't get angry anymore. The God that supervises over Nigeria is always very humble and nice to oppressors. That is not the God we know. And for God to reinvent and reintroduce him to himself to Nigeria, he has to destroy these characters. I'm telling you. And if he does that, I'll be going back to church. Because I haven't been to church in a long time. I am not a religious person, but I'm a very spiritual person. Yes. So, what is my experience with Fela? I met Fela in 1992 at the University of Illinois. We invited him to come and play at our show. And he told us, if I get to your school and I cannot do sound check by 7 p.m., I'm not performing. We thought it was a joke. When he got to our school with 27 women dancers and the place was still under construction, which was a problem of our uh, social secretary. He looked around, went back in his car and left and never came back to perform that night. When we saw him later, he said, of course, he has the only contract in the world which says that after you pay him, he's not under any obligation to perform. That's what happened to him. But he taught me in 1992 something I never knew. Uh, I knew, but I had to be taught in hard way, that you have to be in charge of your destiny at all times. And Fela was a man who was in charge of his own destiny. But I went to do my youth bus service in Yola, Nama State in 1995 when I got there walking to a radio station, Radio Nigeria. The only thing on the wall the only notice from the Ministry of Information is that under no circumstance should you play Fela Nicola Okuti's music in this studio. And that was how it was across Nigeria. Why did I say that? Sometimes we don't celebrate our own. We don't celebrate the contributions that we have made at different times in this country. And that is why I think they don't teach history anymore. Because if we had history in our curriculum. Somebody would have told our children that Obasanjo is a bad person. Somebody would have told our children that Babangida is a thief. Somebody would have told our children and our brothers that a thief was the custom officer who made it by stealing a robbery. Somebody would have taught our children that Buhari is a useless man. Yes. We didn't need, we didn't need Donald Trump to tell us that Buhari is lifeless. <laughs> but here we are, in 2008, there is a debate as to who to choose between the worst and the baddest. Yes. And we are all here still romantic 
fantasizing about what Nigeria should be in the future. Let me tell you, Nigeria has got no future with these guys. This is the truth. We have no future because people who destroy your past cannot guarantee you any future. But it's important also not to forget that you know when people talk about the history of Nigeria, in the way they understand it, they forget to mention that at every point in time, Nigeria always had a problem of leadership. And at every point in time, somebody or a group of people always intervened to take Nigeria out of the doldrums. And number one person who did on his own was Velakuti. And that is why his name that he adopted for himself, Anikula Kokuti, is true to today. The man passed on, but he refused to die in Nigeria. So, as I'm standing in front of you today, and I'm telling you a little bit of my history with Fela, some few years ago, in New York, a friend of mine, Ugugwa Iwilu, called me and said, they're looking for someone to act as Fela. That is, there was going to be a show called Fela on Broadway. And I couldn't think of anybody else than myself. So I presented myself. I presented myself to audition to act that role. And it's the reason I will never sing here today. My voice was so bad. <laughs> Even though my mannerism was exactly like his own, that the guy said, please stop. Uh, we'll see you next time. I didn't do it because I thought I could be fellow on Broadway, but there was something he was that I wanted to be. I wanted to be the first black president on the continent of Africa. Because Fela would have been the best black president we have had, but because our country is always rejecting his best and going for his worst, we didn't appreciate Fela when he was alive. Some of you sitting here, probably your parents scolded you before for listening to his music. Some of you were ostracized for going to the shrine. Some of you were rejected at home because they said you are too philosophical. That is the kind of country we are not coming Or was it Oderiba? He was one of the people who was chanting that Abacha must remain in power. Yes. When we were, yes. yes. Donald Trump was part of the Abacha must stay people. And when we were younger, in our twenties, we fought to drive the Abachas out of power. Comfort, who was former president of NASA, sitting across from here, female, they fought to drive Abacha out of power. We fought to drive Babangida out of power. In 84 days, we drove Sholekon out of power when he legally cornered the position meant for MK, MK Wabiola. But nobody is studying us in history books. We are studying criminals. We are praising criminals. Even some of our presidential candidates and aspirants have little information about us. They, and we must say, Father, forgive them. They look down on us. They look down on our sacrifices in this country. They talk down on us. Because the only Nigeria they know is the Nigeria that talks down on people. The only Nigeria they came to experience is the Nigeria that denigrates its young and youth. Someone asked me when I started running, and I've never told this to this answer before, I said, where Will you have the experience from to be president of Nigeria? You know the usual thing. And my answer was very quickly. How do I get experience when I've never been allowed to do anything in my life by the useless leaders who you claim have experience? It's the same question I was asked when I was applied for scholarship. I think it was one of the oil companies in Nigeria. They came to an area in the cell dome when it was called and said they wanted first class students. Of course, I went there, knowing my nature. 
They said, what's, what's your class in the university? I said, I have. And between second class upper at that time, then I dropped to second class lower. Uh, you know, you know, activism, how it affects you. Know. And then he said, but we're looking for first class students to come for the scholarship. And I told them, if you pollute our water so bad, you pollute, pollute our air so well, how do people breathe this air, drink this water, and have first class? <laughs> it's the same thing for Nigeria. How do you go through so much oppression, denigration, and disgrace by elders such that you are asked for experience? How do you get experience when you've never had a job in your life after graduating from the university? Whichever experience we had, we had to form it ourselves. Whichever jobs we ever had, we had to create those jobs ourselves. And look at people who are like There are people who have never even invented a broom in their lives. Some of them cannot tie their shoelaces. Even the umbrella that they use as their logo, some of them cannot carry it over their head when it is raining or something, you know, the sunshine. So where do you expect us to gain experience from? But the truth is that we have better experience than they do. We have experience fighting for what is right for 30 years in this country. We have experience and a lot of uncelebrated lawyers underneath our belt fighting successive military rulers. We have experience fighting the people fella called international thief thieves in this country. And you know that we have moved from international thief thieves into global robbers. Arms. Because what they were stealing when Fela was angry, they no longer steal those things. Those were days of 10% that they collected from contracts. Now, after they are mobilized, they disappear. In fact, in some cases, to get remobilized again, they will come and destroy the roads that they were contracted to build. We are living in a country of contractors without builders. And the country you are seeing today, this country, Nigeria, this is the country of their dream. The country without roads, the country without hospitals, the country without schools. Is the country of the dreams of the Babangidas of this world? Is the country of the dream of the passengers of this world? Or the Abubakas of this world? the Buharis of this world? And I would say, those who are using overtake, don't overtake. No. We should change and upgrade that to overrun, don't overrun. They have overrun our lives. And the solution, people, is the revolution. We are not going anywhere without adding the revolutionary favor to this next election. If any one of you is still under the illusion that these old baggers, as we call them, we hand over power for luxury to us, we are deceiving ourselves. Any one of us under the illusion that the plastic card that is referred to as the permanent voters card will guarantee you a transfer of power from one generation to the other. You are wasting your time. Yes, because why? That card is already on Alibaba. Yes. They figured out where they cannot control the card. They figured out how to withdraw the card from circulation. Most of Lagos now, they have these cards in their possession. And when election day comes, they will be the ones in control of the cards. Of course, a few of you might vote, but your votes will not count because it has been designed to fail from the beginning. And I'm saying to you, if we won very early, very early, we might actually win the battle before the war. And what is the battle? It's a battle of minds. There's no question about it. A lot of young people are confused. And you cannot blame them. If all you have had your entire life is being battered, and disgraced and denigrated. You will have no self-esteem. And you will not have the ability to even challenge your oppressors. Because most young people in Nigeria don't even know their oppressors. The people who are the oppressors are their role models. That is why you find out that most Nigerian young people are more comfortable with younger musicians who are thinking about things that have no relevance to their lives as opposed to musicians who are singing consciously about the socio-political conditions of our country. So, I can stand here telling you that, well,
these people are old. That's the problem. It is true that they are old. That is what they call gerontocracy. But there are also a lot of young people in the system who are morons. And they are practicing what I call morontocracy. And the combination of these young people and the old people is the way, the reason why Nigeria is in the condition it is today. Each time you find the Buhari, you will find the Yayaha Bello somewhere. The people that gathered in Abuja for the two million man match were all young people from Abacha. The people who like to push for third time in this country were young people in their thirties, right? People who were there saying that Jonathan have no rights to become the president of Nigeria when uh, Gerardua was dying was they were young people. In fact, the person who was speaker of the House of Reps at that time, the Meiji Bangole, was perhaps the youngest of our generation, and he did everything to frustrate. Jonathan coming to power. You know, my sister just said that, you know, this is the worst government we have. I agree with her. But it's a progression because Nigeria has been in a situation that it is today. The, the last government is always better than the next. But that don't mean that the worst, in fact, if you ask me who's, which is the worst government, it hasn't come yet. It's coming next year if we vote for Buhari that would be the worst government you will have because both of them have unfinished business with Nigeria. Atiku was not happy that he didn't steal enough when he was with Obasanjo, that he didn't get enough licenses for university, maybe he didn't get enough oil blocks for himself, and he didn't probably marry enough wives. So when they return, they are coming with vengeance. Vengeance on our resources, vengeance on our people. Atiku is coming back to create a paradise for thieves. And you can see the people who are excited about him. There are other people who stole, who did this thing enough last time, or people who are aspiring to become thieves, including young people. The same thing with Buhari. If Buhari returns this year, he will take away all forms of pretense about human rights, about his support for Islamic extremism, about his respect for your farms, he will take it off because at that time you have nothing at stake. But the truth is this, and I'll say that finally, that it is untrue that there are no young people who can take this country to the next level. You know, a lot of young people are out there who can do fantastic things. But I also agree with the people that who have said it, that it's not enough to be young. You must have a young people who is willing to confront these monsters. Um, our moderator here said it that maybe if Niger Republic gets it right, right, we'll be able to destroy the monster of Boko Haram. I disagree with him. The biggest monster that created Boko Haram is the leadership of Nigeria. And the moment Nigeria gets it right, every other country that is suffering right now we have no option than to get it right. Nigeria is going to become the next sheriff in town. Let me give you an example. Cameroonian activists walked into this country to fight for beer. Yes. They were arrested in Abuja, detained, and sent back to Cameroon to be killed by Bobia, by Buhari's government. If Nigeria were to be a country of conscientious people, those guys will be helping them to put an end to the misery in Cameroon. But the opposite of it is that with what we are doing here because of the kind of useless leadership we have, Cameroon is going to become another body to us, the same way Niger became a body to us, the same way Chad became a body to us. Every time there is a useless African dictator, Nigeria is always part of the people propping them up. Nigeria is part of the leadership that is propping up the Boy Scouts in Togo. Who has been killing his people? They bring him to Abuja to come and have useless negotiations because Nigeria never want other countries to progress because Nigeria is not progressing. So, this is where we have a problem. But well, I don't think it's a problem anymore because now you have clear alternatives. Clear alternatives. You have a chance to either go the route of where we are, where we are coming from, or you have a chance to try something brand new.
I would say lastly, uh, it is not everything that is looking brand new that is original. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, so many of the things we are saying now that is glittering is also not gold. Uh, but you know, as well as said in one of the songs, that this uprising oh. will bring out the peace. Thank you very much. <laughs> just say that um, there was supposed to be a platform where um, aspirants, young aspirants would come together and take a one front. But it's a pity that um, that particular front actually failed. That would have given us enough opportunity to project somebody's um, aspiration instead of having different persons running on different platforms. As it stands now, if you're not careful, this same old order will go back. Yes, if we are not careful, this same old order will go back. 
Well, I want to say very, you know, um, uh, unequivocally that this admission is not the worst. You know, yes, they may not be getting everything right, but you know, time. I think they actually get it right. Thank you very much. Time, you get it right. Time. My name is Tokwe Mbakwadiye. So I have a direct question linked to the contribution this might just be. Um, and it's directly at you, Shiwari, because you've been very, very vocal and attacking people. You're one of those that sort of unpacked the opportunities we would have. Because you were invited and were looking up to having you work with the other young people. But right now, we would have splintered votes. Because you did not bow your ambition to other people that you felt could do, maybe you did not think would do a better job. It's your standing alone going to solve the problem of Nigeria in 2019. By standing alone, would we be better off as young people? Or would it not be better if you had sacrificed your ambition and worked with other people? Kindly answer the question. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Well, I believe uh, everybody spoke very well. Uh, but I think we are doing things a little wrong. You see, even if you do become president, who are you able to meet in the various houses? What policies are you able to make when you have senators and you have House of Assembly members that are still of the old brigade? Now the question is, how many of the youth are willing to run for the House of Representatives, uh, the Senate, and all these other things? Basically because of one reason, no money. 40% of the people here, when they have voter stars, when they receive 5,000 or 10,000 naira, they're going to vote the way they're supposed to vote. So let's be realistic. Until the youth are ready to take over the various houses before we ever think of, you know, taking over the presidency. That is just my uh, contribution. Thank you.
my campaign across Nigeria. They went ahead and had their meeting, signed a memorandum of understanding among themselves. The person who won, Pella, was declared the winner. The person who lost, refused to accept his loss. It wasn't me, it was Kingsley Morgan. But here is what is different, and I want you guys to be clear about it. When I was coming to this debate, I didn't expect to meet Pella Yunis and uh, Obi I was here hoping that I would meet the likes of Buhari and Atiku. Yes. Uh, so, what is that the people we are playing against? There's no matter how much time we spend here, they are the people we are up against. And I've said it very clear, we'll get to a point where boys will be separated from men, and men will be separated from bad, old, useless men. And that is the reason I'm projecting myself. Even at the end of the day, if all the young people agree to one candidate, it doesn't guarantee you the chance of victory. If that one young person, if that one young person is not going to be able to do what is necessary, and I saw it in one of our meetings, in the meetings I had. One of the candidates said that old people ask them to go and choose a young person who they can accept. And the moment they said that, I knew I was not the one. Because I'm not going to be presented to some old people to be accepted. I'm the one acceptable candidate. I am here to retire the old guys. If necessary, as we have said, the system will take care of them. itself. I mean, institutions and take care of some of them. So when I start hearing those kind of vibrations from young candidates that they, they have met with some of the others, I started thinking maybe they have met with Obasanjo. Yeah. And if Obasanjo met with them, it might, I will not be his choice. And I never want to be the choice of the old guys. We want to send them back in. in the <laughs> <laughs> uh,
and there was no way to turn. And there was a particular kind of uh, political naivete that made us absolutely fearless. We did not understand the consequences of what it is we were doing in the threat of the military. What we knew was that we didn't want these people and we would challenge the system. And some of us died, some of us were missing. I mean, told them, I don't want to go back to that history, but there's been a price to pay. The question is, are young Nigerians willing to pay the price for their own emancipation? That's right. That is the question. That's right, that is the question. You cannot touch that issue. There will always be blood on the floor. It's right. not going to happen. Without, there is no such thing as a free deal. You can slide, talk, evade, be denied about it. What is at stake is not Nigeria per se. Nigeria might disintegrate, and along that with all of us, what is at stake is your own collective future. That is really what the issue is. So the question again, young people, a bit political now and rhetorical, is that are you willing to rise out of relative obscurity to find your mission and to fulfill it, hopefully, or like the rest of us have done, generation over generation, and we betray it. It just continues. We have a green map, we have a small window now of really beginning to collectively address this issue by changing the narrative. But if you're going to change the narrative, you must create your story. What is your story for the future? How do you define and reshape and define what it is you want for your country? If you're unclear about it, other people will define it for you. And they are done to by this. I wouldn't have even voted for him if I were part of the part and he was part of it. 
but for different reasons. Activists have their own, they are useful, they get things done, but they are not the best leaders. Commitment you make to us to let us know that you are really serious 
about taking the reins of power in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just want to start by making a comment directly to you, Chair. The first time when, sorry, my name is Akio, I'm sorry. The first time when this set of questions came for the panel, you attempted to omit the lady on the panel. That's something that happens quite often, and that's something that is wrong. Absolutely, well, no, no, no. There was no strategy. I'm sorry. I'm making the point. That's my yes. I'm making that point to you. There's a lot of time to try and overlook women, but that's by the way. Um, what I wanted to say in terms of the speakers here today, I haven't heard anything about ideology. I haven't heard anything about politics. I've just heard a lot of morality, young people, old people. Power is not about a question of young or old people. Power is about politics. Power is about ideology. I haven't heard that. Power is not about your morality or how nice you are or how wonderful we should be to each other. So that suggests to me that some of the people running do not actually understand what they're actually involved in. The first speaker came up and talked about um, Tafa Balewa the first time he went to the US and he was received by you know, the American state. The American state is a criminal imperialist state that always looks to its interest in other nations. So if a young person does not understand what America is about and that kind of mentality wants to rule Nigeria, I will be very afraid of that kind of person. No politics, no ideology. And even from the rest of the speakers, you know, there's a lot of issues about what's wrong with Nigeria. Nigeria is not Nigeria on its own. Nigeria is a country within Africa. Africa is a continent within world politics. What is your politics? What is your outview on the world? What are your policies? What are the issues? Not just about taking over from this set of criminals that rule us. Because this set of criminals, by the way, the, 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 the criminality in the Nigerian ruling class did not start today or yesterday. Mm -hmm. From 1960, we have been ruled by neo-colonial criminals. Yes. And it seems to me that some of the young people, some of them who are running today, are actually pro-PRO. They are pro-colonial people. Yes. People who hold up the United Kingdom, yes. who hold up France. Macron came to visit Nigeria, went to shrine. Macron is an imperialist criminal. And I don't know if he would have been received by Fela if Fela was alive. We must get our politics and our ideology correct. Thank you very much, Chair. I've stayed the course to today. I fought against military rule. Also with Afion, Afion who just spoke. She was uh, a student leader at the University of Lagos. At that time, her name was Julian Saudi Cole. Yes, at that, that was her name. That name is no longer in existence today. She has changed her name from a neo-colonial name to an authentic African name. <laughs> I also have in the house another witness who can witness for me even in church or a shrine or in mosque, Barista Femi Falano, who was my lawyer, who has been my lawyer for 30 years. He just walked into the house. So it's not about staying the course, it's about the fact that we have remained resilient, unbound, and undaunted. 
for 30, 29 years plus. It will be 30 years next year. And I say to people, if I were to be in the army, I would probably be a field marshal by now. So there's nothing to worry about. There's pedigree, there's history, man. What you should question are those who don't have enough understanding of the problems. And for Afion, Afion, my great teacher, when I was a, uh, a young student at the University of Lagos, the response we had today is a symbolic response to what you find also on the high table. We are discussing contemporary Nigeria. Sometimes I do not go the ideological route so as not to confuse too many people. But there's no doubt that we are also ideologically grounded. And you would know that when nobody knew that the World Bank was useless, or the IMF was international monetary fraud, we were fighting against their policies at the university. When the military were doing the breathing of the new colonial masters as we were talking about, we fought them. The young man sitting in front of me here has also fought oil companies, successive oil companies that are degrading and destroying our environment. Honestly, if this country were to be fair to us, there will be no argument about the young person who can lead us to victory and the future. And I'll say this before you collect the microphone from me. I'm not bragging. I am seeing young people who have stepped out of the shadows. If you are young or you have ideas and you can rule this country, don't stay in the shadows. Because when you do so, you allow charlatans and non-entities to rule your country. So that is my position. Last question about why we want to start from the top. The fact is this, man. Who at the top is better than us today? If anybody wants to be a counselor, we have a political party. You can join and be a counselor. If you want to be a senator, we have African Action Congress. You can join and have and become a senator. I, Omo Yenle Shore, Qualified and even more qualified than some of these people you have, that we are talking about today. I'm stepping out to be president of Nigeria because I know I can run this country. I'm starting at the top, but I didn't come from the top. I came from the bottom 30 years ago, and now we must rise to the top.
So, what is the content, the ideological content of the education? Now, if you look out there, you see a map of Africa. We have there, that map, you would have seen Cameroon, you would have seen Gaddafi, you would have seen Muhammad Mohammed, amongst others. These are dead people. They left the legacy.